you, uh, Juanetta and uh, Premier Cochran, uh, welcome and thank thank you. Just a little bit of background on on today's uh, program. We uh, Commonwealth North, as you know, was uh, founded by Alaska's first two governors, Governor Bill Egan, a Democrat, and Governor Wally Hickel, a Republican, to be a bipartisan policy forum to help Alaska uh, achieve the goals of statehood, uh, the goals of self determination, and. Uh, uh, toward that, we also have had a study group on the Arctic, uh, which in 2009 published a book called Why the Arctic Matters. And we decided to have a study group this year to update that for the new president, whomever that was going to be. Uh, and uh, as we're changing presidents, it's actually a very important time to put this out. One of the big questions the study group has asked is how should we be advancing cooperation with our neighbors? And uh, we have had uh, good cooperation with the Northwest Territory, uh, sometimes looked with jealousy as you got more control of Crown lands than we did in, in, in Alaska. Uh, sometimes looked uh, at common opportunities such as the A2A Railroad and uh, uh, the study that you've got going on on LNG export now. Uh, sometimes looked at uh, common issues in terms of empowering indigenous people and uh, reconciliation. And uh, we, we're very, very pleased to have you uh, with us today. Um, just a, one other thing by background, uh, we have several Arctic Thought Leader partners who've been helping us on this uh, study, including the Arctic Domain Awareness Center at the University of Alaska, which is funded by our Department of Homeland Security, but works very closely with the Canadian military in the North, the uh, Directorate in the North. Uh, the Institute of the North, founded by Governor Hickel, Arctic Encounter, uh, a, 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 an organization which holds an annual meeting in Seattle to which your predecessor has attended many times and we hope to see you there. Uh, the Polar Institute in, in uh, London, uh, Arctic Today, the Arctic Newsletter and the, uh, 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 the Polar Institute uh, at the Wilson Center in Washington where I think you may have already had a chance to speak but uh, if not as co-chair of that group, I'd invite you to be there as well. So with that, uh, we'd like to open this up for you to give us remarks on what uh, the Northwest Territory is doing now and, and thinking about in the Arctic. And uh, uh, the biggest single question we have is how should Alaska and the NWT be working together? So thank you very much. And uh, Premier Cochran, uh, I, I didn't formally introduce you except to say that you were recently made Premier of the Northwest Territories, congratulations. Uh, you've served in the Legislative Assembly for some time and have held other portfolios, including uh, uh, and, and still hold the portfolio Minister of Executive and Indigenous Affairs, the Minister of uh, responsible for the COVID-19 uh, Coordinating Secretariat. And you have a very strong and long background in education, housing, public works, homelessness, and the status of women. And you have a degree in social work 20 years experience in administration and direct service provision, and you represent uh, a district in the, uh, the area of Yellowknife. So thank you very much for joining us today. Sounds great. Thank you as well um, for the introduction. Uh, I'll take you on my uh, next election campaign team if you're interested. <laughs> So I, I think we have a presentation on. I wanna, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I want to uh, talk about the work of our government in building a strong and resilient Northwest Territories. Um, I'll start by providing some general information about the territory, uh, some of our key priorities of this government and look at potential areas as stated for cooperation between our jurisdictions. First, uh, next slide, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to start by giving a, a short overview of the Northwest Territories to give you a sense of the scope of the land and the population. As Northerners, you're going to be familiar with many of our challenges in the North as well. So for us, we have a small population, only 45,000 people, and it's spread across a huge land mass of 1.3 million square kilometers. We have 33 communities for 45,000 people from our southern border at the 60th parallel to islands in the Beaufort Sea in the north. Our communities vary greatly, um, which makes it difficult for us. 
About half of the population, 20,000 people, live in the capital city of Yellowknife. Our smallest com community, Kakiza, has a population of 36 people, and all of those communities need the same resources, so it shows some of the challenge in that. The access to the communities varies. For example, as you see on the map, some of, uh, some of the uh, have all season roads, others can only be accessed by air or winter road, and some are only accessible by air only. So we're always still looking for, for highways and road infrastructure. Communities along the Mackenzie River and the Arctic coast depend on annual marine resupply to bring in our vital goods, such as food, fuel and construction materials, which accounts for our huge expenses as well. As well as that, it uh, gives challenges to be able to uh, receive adequate public services and enjoy a reasonable quality of life. Especially with COVID-19, it's hard when we have no community access to the communities and we're telling people to stay. So, Within the territories, we have both public and indigenous governments. The Territorial Legislative Assembly, we have a whole of uh, 19 members. And with the most recent assembly was just elected in October, 2019. And that's when I took the seat as premier. Before that, I was a, a cabinet minister for four years. The 19th uh, Legislative Assembly represents a number of firsts. First, we have a number, a record number of women uh, MLAs, nine out of 19. Previously, in the last government, we had two. The maximum we've had in any government has been three. Um, so this was a huge record and a huge achievement for women in the Northwest Territories. We also have the greatest number of first-time MLAs. As in previous years, the majority of our MLAs are still Inuit, Dene, and Métis, which represents our, our population. Another key feature of this assembly is the importance we place on partnerships with the Indigenous governments. Next slide. They forgot the extra slide in there. Oops. And uh, next slide, thank you, you're good there. So half of the population, like I said, is indigenous in the Northwest Territories. And within that, because of that, we recognize 11 official languages. Nine of the our official languages in the NWT are indigenous languages. And then of course, uh, for us, it's English and French are our, our other languages that are official, which means everything we do has to be translated into 11 languages. The traditional territory of some of the our indigenous populations, such as the Inuvaluit and the Gwich'in, cross borders into Alaska, actually. So, um, which is nice. A lot of family members live in both uh, jurisdictions. Most of the indigenous governments in the territories have settled land claims, and some also have self-government. Negotiations regarding the land resources and self-government are an ongoing work as we work with Indigenous governments and the government of Canada to complete these agreements. The government of the Northwest Territory is committed to building strong, respectful relationships with Indigenous governments as we work together to deliver and improve on the programs and services in all communities. We take the philosophy that uh, if we can strengthen the Indigenous governments, then we uh, lower the work for the GNWT more people working with Indigenous governments means less people on, in our housing programs and in our income support, etc. So we have a bilateral relationships with nine of the Indigenous governments and we meet regularly with them to achieve our common goals. As I discussed the priorities of the government of the Northwest Territories, it's important to note that they have been developed with input from the Indigenous governments as well. Next slide. Okay, before I turn to the Government of the Northwest Territories international priorities, I want to look at our domestic priorities. These reflect common challenges across the Canadian North, and I'm sure they will resonate with uh, Alaskans as well. They all represent areas which we would be more than happy to cooperate with Alaska to learn from each other and share best practices. I speak about these under the general heading of people, prosperity, place and partnership. First area is uh, housing people. Housing is a key factor in the in the health and the well-being of our residents. Uh, COVID-19 brought that to the forefront with a lack of uh, adequate housing. We were forced as a government to pay for isolation centers at a huge cost to us as well. 
Next to Nunavut, the Northwest Territory experiences some of the most significant housing challenges of any province and territory in Canada. Housing, specifically increasing the number of affordable housing and reducing our core housing need is one of the foremost priorities of this territorial government. Some of the stats we have is that one in six households rely on our public housing programs. One out of six people, that's a lot of people in housing. The government in the Northwest Territory spends six to eight percent of our total expenditures on housing, more than any other jurisdiction in Canada, my understanding. There are currently 900 families and individuals on our public housing wait list. At present, 30 percent of our units are over 40 years of age. Repairs and upgrades will help in some instances, but in others, they're overdue for replacement. So getting the right approach that will truly address our housing uh, crisis is complex. How do we meet the growing social needs? We all, uh, as we also want to improve our current conditions, we want to meet the needs of the elderly, the vulnerable and the homeless, and we want to develop a private rental market of affordable places to live so there's less need on social housing. Some of our communities have no housing except for the government uh, Northwest Territory housing or ones that we've given to them. So a partnership approach is required, along with significant long-term investment. Our government alone can address the housing needs of our residents. We're currently in discussions with the Government of Canada to establish a multi-year plan with adequate funding to support this important priority. This would address some of our goals in the federal government's recent Arctic and Northern Policy Framework, which I'll talk about later on. Next slide. Um, did one before, yeah. Uh, under the headline people as well, we have uh, health, mental health and families. So as I said, housing is one of the key social detriments of health in the Northwest Territories. Other factors include food security, culture and language, mental wellness and the availability of health services. Understanding how these detriments are interconnected is essential when designing, developing, implementing, and funding our health programs and services across the territory. The government of the Northwest Territory is working to provide greater supports for residents through our healthcare system. We're working to increase the number and variety of culturally respectful, community-based mental health and addiction programs, including aftercare. In regards to substance use, there's no single solution that will fit the needs of all individuals. The government, our government is working to ensure that residents have access to a range of options to fit their unique needs and situations. Again, the greatest impact will come from collaborative partnerships across departments and governments that include communities and Indigenous governments and that will address the range of detriments. Next slide. The next area is uh, Northern People, Northern Jobs. So increasing the social and economic resilience of the Northwest Territories means we have to significantly up our game around our post-secondary education. Last year, after an extensive review, our government committed to transforming Aurora College into a polytechnic university by 2025. Success of the new polytechnic will rely on co-investment partnerships with the federal and indigenous governments. It'll also look to industry and community partnerships to help develop and expand teaching and research programs across the entire territory. As with any polytechnic, the focus will be on hands-on learning for in-demand jobs of the North and applied research. We've established a new Northern teaching and research programs in four areas, environmental management, health, community wellness, the Northern economy of, the, of our future. The Polytechnic is going to be a university for all Northerners, integrating Indigenous ways of knowing and doing into what and how it teaches. We're going to see this as critical in supporting reconciliation. Indigenous Northerners are our leaders. We also look forward to attracting researchers from around the world, experts in permafrost, permafrost research, Indigenous knowledge sharing, and Northern governance. One thing that uh, we'll also state within our uh, JK to 12, junior kindergarten to 12 program. We also have what's called a new to the North program because a lot of our educators are from the South. So we also provide a, every uh, educator is provided with a 
training on um, residential schools and the impact that that's had on our people. So I think that's something we're very proud of as well. Next slide. The next heading is place, climate change. Climate change, I think, affects us all. In the NWT, the health of the land is integral to the health of our people. Ecosystem changes due to climate change are affecting our food, food security as access to country food becomes less reliable and it's our indigenous populations are so dependent on that food system. In small indigenous communities in the NWT, half of all households depend on protein derived from country food, specifically meat and fish. Major climate change impacts are already evident in the territory and we have very little environmental monitoring compared to the southern Canada. Given the size of the territory, the challenge of environmental monitoring is vast, but not impossible if we make good use of the capacity that exists in all of our 33 communities. Communities, Indigenous governments and organizations in the Northwest Territories want to take a more active role in adapting to and mitigating climate change. Guardian programs are a great way for the Indigenous people to lead this work. These programs support the Indigenous people to be on the land, build their knowledge of the changing landscape, while providing opportunities to mentor their youth and collect valuable data. Guardian programs also support Indigenous people to take a leadership role in research, outreach and planning, and in the implementation of climate change actions. Next page. Prosperity, investing in strategic infrastructure. Closing the significant gaps in transportation, energy and communication infrastructure remains a high priority for our government. As experienced with COVID-19, many of our schools had to shut down. Um, we were trying to get students onto online uh, learning at the, at the beginning, and we realized that our, how significant our lack of internet, lack of bandwidth um, became a huge issue for the Northwest Territories. So these, uh, these three, the, the infrastructure, energy and transportation are three key in, in ingredients to a sustainable economy and better quality of life by reducing the cost of, uh, for people and businesses, opening access to new markets, helping shift to a greener energy and creating good high paying jobs for our residents. Again, given our small population and large geographic size, we have to rely on the government of Canada to provide funding for many of these projects. The federal government has made a number of recent inve investments into our infrastructure projects Con by connecting our communities along the Mackenzie Highway, still going on, long process, working towards improved access into the slave geological province with its resource rich potential needed for the long term economic sustainability of our territory and the Tolson expansion project which will provide cost-effective green energy to industry, communities and residents and help the NWT to meet its target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Our government's working closely with Indigenous governments on these projects, which may include exploring finan financing models with the Indigenous partners in the future. Last but not least is the continued enhancement of broadband that will support the education and health sectors as well as business. We'll continue to advocate strongly for affordable bandwidth service for business and consumers. Increased reliancy of network services, including redundant uh, network service and increased mobile network coverage along road corridors to improve the health and safety of travelers. And as I stated, to assist us if, uh, hopefully not, but if another pandemic uh, arises and we have to shut our schools. Next slide. Partnerships. Uh, this government strong on partnerships. So we believe that the uh, partnerships are essential to building a resilient Northwest Territories. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, our relationship with the government of Canada is key to achieving those goals. The federal government's Arctic and Northern Policy Framework, which was released uh, last year in September 2019, is built on the recognition that persistent and large gaps remain between the quality of life and services experienced by Indigenous and Northerners and that of the average Canadian in the South. One of our, the main purposes of the framework is to coordinate federal action and investment to close these gaps over the next 10 years 
in partnership with our government and Indigenous governments. We worked with the Government of Canada and the NWT Indigenous governments to develop this Arctic and Northern policy framework. The framework goals are similar to those of the Government of the Northwest Territories. They include healthy and resilient communities, strong economies, strengthened infrastructure, healthy ecosystems, and reconciliation with Indigenous people. Each territory was given the opportunity to outline our own priorities regarding the sustainability and development of the North. In collaboration with the Indigenous governments in the territory and other stakeholders, we released the NWT Northwest Territory chapter at the same time the Government of Canada released the main document. COVID-19 though has delayed the implementation and regret regrettably, intensified the issues, issues for Northern populations, such as hunger, food security, and, and housing. Going forward, we're gonna be advocating for a robust investment plan to address our social and our economic issues post pandemic. Next slide. So now I'd like to turn it to areas where we have common interests with Alaska and where we can either establish partnerships or enhance the existing cooperation. Next slide. Marine transportation services. So our oceans are opening up. The Northwest Territories is in some ways remote from your state. We do not share a border. Traveling from one jurisdiction to the other by road makes for a very long trip and requires travel through either the Yukon or, Br or British Columbia. In many respects, we share a closer connection by water. For instance, the Government of the Northwest Territories is the only entity delivering a full-service marine transportation operation in Canada's Western Arctic. In 2016, we purchased the assets of the Northern Transportation Company Limited after they filed for bankruptcy, and it became clear that no private company would step forward. Our Northern Transportation uh, is provided tug and barge services, along the Mackenzie River and into the Arctic Ocean, offering essential resupply for those communities which needed to continue. The, uh, go our government's marine transportation services offers a full suite of services to communities and commercial clients, transporting heavy cargo and fuel on freshwater routes along the Western Arctic seacoast. We have been working to improve both the fleet and our service since first setting up the marine transportation services. And last summer, we took possession of four new double hauled barges. These vessels have the capacity to carry multiple types of petroleum products and deck cargo, cargo and meet both Canadian and US standards. Marine Transport Services has recently teamed with uh, Crowley Government Services of Alaska on a five-year contract to deliver fuel to the north, warning sites of Canada's Western Arctic. So I thank you for that partnership as well. We carry on the tradition of the uh, NTCL, which provided the service to both the United States and the Canadian Defense Department for many decades. Reliable resupply of these radar sites is important to the Arctic military efforts of the United States and Canada. Our government's pleased to team with an experienced carrier to accomplish this work in support of an international bilateral defense project. It also presents an economic development opportunity, providing a revenue stream that sustains an essential service for our communities and increasing our ability to offer employment to Northerners. Most of our marine transport services employees are territorial residents, and most of these residents are Indigenous. Next slide. Resource development. It was mentioned that uh, my background is in social, but uh, I'm a diamond driller's daughter. So I've actually also got uh, over 20 years of working in the business field with uh, mineral resources. So <laughs> uh, like Alaska, our territory is rich in petroleum uh, potential and can hold as much as 37% of Canada's marketable light crude oil and 35% of its marketable natural gas. Discovered and recoverable potential for the NWT offshore and onshore is estimated at 1.2 billion barrels of conventional oil and 16.4 trillion cubic feet of conventional natural gas. 
Ultimate conventional potential is estimated to be over five times that. These estimates do not account for the larger possible reserves in the deep waters of the Beaufort Sea, which have yet to be explored. Despite an extensive history of petroleum exploration, there has been relatively little production north of the Arctic Circle to date, which means there's significant unrealized potential. The federal moratorium on offshore petroleum um, by our government in the Canadian Arctic, including the Beaufort Sea, is set to expire by the end of this year, and a decision is pending on whether or not it'll be extended. The government, our government is a participant in that decision making and likely shares Alaska's interest in ensuring that the goals and aspirations of subnational governments are emphasized rather than national interests. We think that NWT petroleum resources and particularly liquefied natural gas could play a role in reducing reliance on more carbon intensive fuel resource sources such as coal. The Northwest Territories in Alaska share many interests in this regard, such as protecting the Northern environment while maximizing Northern benefits and revenues. For the NWT, Indigenous participation in, de in decision-making is a given. So for example, we're currently negotiating an offshore oil and gas accord with the federal government, Yukon, and the Inuvala Regional Corporation, which is an Indigenous government that we expect will be signed this year. The Inuvaluate uh, Regional Corporation is a full partner at the negotiating table and will be full partner in all decision making. Next slide. Wildlife management. Uh, while recognizing the importance of resource development, our government also promotes a balanced and sustainable approach that supports our goal to manage and conserve wildlife and protect and provide for the health and well being of people in the territories. Recognizing a great deal of the wildlife across our shared Arctic coast is transboundary. Um, can't tell care we're not to go into your territory and we're not telling your care we're not to come into ours. Um, <laughs> so we've had a long relationship, a long history of collaborative management and conservation of these shared resources through a number of treaties and agreements. The GNWT is a party to the Canadian Porcupine Caribou Management Agreement, which is represented on the International Porcupine Caribou Board. As such, our territory has a responsibility to support the stewardship and conservation of the herd and protection of subsistence harvest by Gwich'in and Inuvaluit of the Northwest Territories, which are our Indigenous governments in the northern part of, of the, ter the territory. We understand that the establishment of the Arctic National Wildlife Rift refuge was a measure to balance the protection of the herd's habitat and calving grounds with responsible development. We're actively following the situation regarding the management of the ANWR, which stands for Arctic... Uh, um, sorry, the... ANWR? <laughs> sorry. The, we got so many acronyms. Uh, Ar yeah, Ar Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Premier. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we have made submissions to the United States government about the importance of sustainable development and a balanced approach to the management of wildlife such as caribou, which affects the well-being of residents who depend on them. Appropriate engagement, consultation, assessment and regulation are essential so that steps can be taken to address potential adverse impacts to social, so, to social environmental, cultural and economic components. We're all concerned concerned with the recent decision to open up most of the porcupine the caribou calving and post calving grounds within the uh, Arctic Northern Wildlife Refuge to oil and gas development does not consider the cultural importance of the herd and impacts to subsistence harvesting rights, which we believe are significant and we support greater consultation with the Gwich'in and the Inuvaluit. Next slide. International Circumpolar Forums. Finally, I want to speak about our government's participation in international forums. Our COVID-19 response has meant that we've been focused on internal matters, and I haven't been able to participate in international forums in the way that I would have liked. I look forward to greater engagement in the future. The government of the Northwest Territory has an interest in working across the borders and with Indigenous Northerners 
to improve the social, economic, and cultural well-being of the Arctic regions. We have been participating in a number of forums over the years. Alaska also uh, participates in many of those forums. For example, the, our government participates on the Canadian delegation to the Arctic Council, although we didn't go last year. And they, our staff have contributed to a number of working group projects, including gender equity, alternative energy, and best practices on environmental regulatory systems. The Arctic Circle Assembly, based in Iceland, has become an important platform for sharing information and building networks across the circumpolar north. The, our government has planned on making a presentation at last year's assembly on social and economic recovery after COVID, along with the government of Nunavut and the government of Canada. However, unfortunately, it was postponed, and we look forward to participating this year, hopefully. Well, our government is a subnational uh, government, and defense issues are a federal responsibility. We have a strong interest in the safety and security of our residents. Along with the Department of National Defense, the Yukon, and Nunavut, the government of the Northwest Territory co-chairs the Arctic Security Working Group, which was formed in 1999 to discuss and exchange knowledge on security issues related to the Canada's North. Alaskans also participate in this group and this strengthens our working relationship across our jurisdictions. Alaska and the NWT are both members of the Pacific Northwest uh, economic region, which also offers opportunities for collaboration. I understand that the organization is recommending that the new US uh, administration emphasize greater collaboration and coordination with Canada on Arctic issues. I see that as a good thing. Next slide. And uh, so this is my last slide. I just want to say thank you again for being invited to, uh, for the attention to learn a little bit more about the North. And I'm happy to discuss any uh, of our priorities and uh, areas of cooperation with you. So I'll turn it back to you and uh, open for any questions. Thank you. Well, Premier, thank you very much. And I'm going to hand the microphone back to Juanetta Ayers, who's uh, moderating questions. I may add a few of my own later on, but uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Premier Cochran, and thank you, Mead. Uh, to all of our participants, you can submit your questions at any time through the uh, Zoom chat window. Again, uh, please uh, remember to keep them brief and to the point, and we will uh, aggregate or, or consolidate questions as, as uh, the themes arise in, in any of the questions. Um, one question uh, for you, Premier, uh, with regard to the planned highway development in the Northwest Territories, uh, are there any plans to lay terrestrial fiber during that process to expand your broadband net network through uh, terrestrial fiber? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, we do recognize that any, uh, any corridors that we open up, any uh, communities that we provide transportation, it's the logical time to actually bring in uh, broadband uh, internet services. So uh, we have worked with the federal government um, in the last, uh, I think it was a year, year and a half ago, we uh, brought the fiber link up to a Nuvik area that still has to be expanded. And now we're building a road to Wati and we're in uh, negotiations as well, discussing with our, our service providers to actually be able to open up that. Like I said before, um, with COVID-19 hitting and the not only the students, but all public. Um, I'm sitting on Zoom. I would rather be in person for a lot of meetings. Um, it, it really emphasized the need for, for expanded broadwood. So absolutely, it's in our priorities. Wonderful, thank you. Um, um, forgive my ignorance. I'm not uh, that aware of what uh, Canadian Coast Guard assets you may have in the Northwest Territories, but uh, we've heard frequently from uh, Coast Guard personnel and uh, looked at Coast Guard strategies for the Arctic uh, from the United States perspective. I'm wondering if you could share anything about uh, what Coast Guard assets exist in the Northwest Territories from the Canadian side and um, maybe if you have anything you can share about what the, the Canadian Coast Guard's plans might be. Yeah, so I, I don't exactly know what all of their assets are. I do know that they have a presence in the North. I also know that the Northwest Territories has been uh, talking about Arctic sovereignty for, 
I'm 60 years old for as long as I can remember, we've been talking to our federal government about that, the need for it. With the opening up of the sea, um, it's become a, a bit bigger process for it. It's, it's become a bigger need. Um, we are lobbying to the federal government to actually have more ports um, in our northern communities, more access to them, a bigger pro uh, presence um, from the federal government to protect us. Um, we know that with the opening of the sea brings uh, competition from all different uh, jurisdictions and some good, some bad, but we want to make sure that our, our people are safe. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, apparently uh, some of the chat is, is being uh, directed to my, uh, my colleague, Aaron, so we're kind of uh, relaying messages. Um, uh, an additional question with regard to uh, uh, fiber build out or extension, and I'm sorry, I don't know the, the place name pronunciation. Is it Tuktoyatuk? Tuktoyatuk, <laughs> uh, -tuk, that's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, you're invited to Nunavagalak anytime you want to come. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was the question? Sorry. Uh, well, uh, so is is there any plans to uh, extend fiber to that uh, community as part of your current uh, priorities and strategies for broadband fiber? Yes, so we're looking to expand our, our services broadband to, into all communities that don't have it. Um, like I said, um, we did bring the fiber link up to Inuvik, so it's it's we still have to expand on that. But it's not only the north, it's all regions in the NWT. Um, not only did COVA bring it forward, but our education system is not uh, at the same standard as, as education in the South. So we did a trial uh, within our education, uh, the Department of Education, a few years back, what we call distance ed, Northern Distance Education Learning, which is not like the normal distance ed where you get a book. Um, many years ago, I took a distance ed in art um, because I thought it was easy. And it was easy, except I lost interest in it and I failed it because I never finished the course. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> so we learned from that. So we have a distance ed program that actually has a live instructor in Anubic and then they use the internet to uh, access students in uh, I believe 10 communities. It's successful within Eula Hooktuk, which is another hard uh, community mm -hmm. to, uh, to pronounce. Um, two years ago, with the first time because of the, our Northern Distance Learning, the very first time that we've had three students graduate from grade 12 and go south and be able to access post-secondary directly. Most of our students have to do two years upgrading because of our education system. So it shows that that system works, but it's, it's solely reliant on having the access. So broadband is a, uh, broadband is a huge issue for the Northwest Territories so that we can access proper education for our students. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Premier, we certainly, uh, we have another study group that has been looking at food security for actually the last several years. Uh, some of it prompted by a major 7.2 earthquake that we had in South Central Alaska in late 2018. And uh, just highlighted that uh, we have some great sensitivities and bottleneck uh, points with regard to uh, getting regular food supplies to Alaska. I know that um, although you do have land routes to many parts of your, your of Northwest Territories, um, what uh, do you see are the critical issues with food security in the Northwest Territories and how are you addressing those? Food security is a huge issue. Um, like I said, uh, some of our communities, you go in there and, and just for a leader, um, I think you're called gallon in the States, though it might not be leaders, um, a liter of milk or a gallon of milk is like over $20 um, for just a basic milk. So some of our program, some of our communities in the North are sub uh, uh, subsidized by the federal government and what's called a Nutrition North program. The problem is, is it doesn't reach all communities and, and all communities in the Northwest Territories have the huge issue with the uh, cost of, of food. The other issue we have is of course, um, being huge indigenous population, mostly more so in our Northern communities, there's huge reliance on, on country food, which is uh, meat, uh, mm -hmm. fish, caribou, moose, et cetera. And uh, with the climate change, the, the caribou aren't, uh, aren't migrating at the same speed. We're losing populations, the porcupine, et cetera. So, um, and it's, and the, the, 
the profits for private business wasn't working. And that's why we had to start our own marine transportation services. Private enterprises had it and they weren't making money at it. So uh, we didn't have much choice. We had to start our own marine transportation services to ensure that people in the communities got food at some kind of reasonable cost. And although we're looking at eventually, hopefully the marine transportation will show a profit at this point, it's not, it's, um, it's the GNWT is subsidizing it. So food security is a huge issue um, and will remain so. And it is something that uh, we're constantly on the federal government to expand at least their Nutrition North program. So um, with regard to, I think you've kind of answered this. Uh, we had another question come in while you were, you were asking that question. Um, <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so the government is subsidizing through the Nutrition North program and through the uh, transportation program to get foods to uh, rural communities in Northwest Territories. And um, a question about how the marine transportation services are, are structured is that, um, I'm not sure if you would call it a, like a crown corporation or a, how is that structured? Um, we, we would call them in Alaska an enterprise um, corporation or a state corporation. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I'd call it almost a nonprofit corporation because <laughs> we're not making a profit on it. <laughs> but it is, I guess you could call it a crown corporation in that it's owned by the government of the Northwest Territories. Okay. Um, and, and still more questions coming in about broadband. Uh, we seem to be very preoccupied about telecommunications, but uh, uh, for, for your most remote communities are uh, as other infrastructure, like for example, we have uh, microwave and satellite systems that are supplementing terrestrial communication networks. That, can you speak to what your reliance is on the, those infrastructure systems? Well, we, like I said, um, reliance is a difficult word to use for it. I would consider that we're very reliant on it. Some people, indigenous people might say, we're not reliant at all. We're traditional people, we go out in the land. I think one of our bigger problems without, with uh, besides the distance and the cost to be put them in is that right at this moment, we have one service provider in the Northwest Territories, which does cause us a little bit of problem. It means that, um, that we have to uh, um, work with that stakeholder as well. But we do rely heavily on satellites within our smaller communities, many of the communities. And uh, like I said, uh, Satellite is great to have, but if the weather is bad, uh, there are incidences where it does cause us issues. So we're looking more at the fiber optic line is where we're hopeful for. Okay. All right, well, I don't see any additional questions. Oops. Sure. I thought I was on mute. I didn't see any additional questions coming in. So I'm gonna to turn to Mead to see if he has any additional questions at this time. Uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you. Um, Premier, you mentioned in, in your discussion that uh, uh, you're reworking kind of the, the, the moratorium on Beaufort Sea production. And I know that you've had some major discoveries there. And I also know that, I guess your predecessor assessor sent out a red alert because there hadn't been very much consultation when Pre uh, President Obama and, and uh, Premier Trudeau had kind of jointly done the moratorium. Our, our moratorium was permanent and it's now tied up in the courts. But what, what do you expect to happen there? And also, what, do you, what role do you think Arctic shipping will have uh, in marketing your resources, whether it's LNG or, or the condensates that have been discovered there on your coast? Well, um, two things. Uh, kind of feel bad for you. I mean, I was uh, not very happy when the moratorium got called in Canada, but at least it only had a few years. And then we, uh, we actually do have a place net and that's where we are now that we can actually negotiate on it. Um, so uh, we are hoping, we're working with the Yukon government and the Inuvaluate Corporation to be able to uh, have a say. We're, we're real strong advocates that uh, nothing in the North about the Northern people without a Northern say in it, nothing about the North without North. Um, so uh, we're in the process of negotiating at this point. I do believe that the federal government is interested in working with us. I sure hope so, because if not, uh, that'd be another issue. And we're just doing a scientific assessment right now about the impact of that, what it will be. Um, we, there is nothing going on up there right now, but we know that there's potential up there. 
And so maybe right now it's not in the market, but the market will open up, I, I believe that. And at that point, um, we will be looking at shipping. Like I said, the sea is opening up. Before it would have had to be brought down to the south, but uh, with the sea opening, which isn't might not be a good thing because of climate change, it does mean that there might be other opportunities to use our northern ports um, to to provide shipping internationally as well. And and I guess your government did announce an LNG study that is going on now or about to about to go on to to look at shipping offshore. And of course, we're we're doing one in Alaska as well. Uh, a second, a second question is, you mentioned uh, 11 official languages, nine of them indigenous. Uh, what have you done in the education system, uh, street names, place names, and so forth to help preserve languages? And I know that's that's been a big issue here and maybe one of those places for cooperation on best practices. Yes. So as for street names, that would be municipal governments. Um, some municipal governments are more active with that than others. Uh, some of our communities, like I said, uh, Kukiza with 36 people, probably don't even have a street sign. Um, so they might not, it might not be on their radar. But we are uh, working with Indigenous governments uh, with a, within our Department of Municipal and Community Affairs, um, working to ensure that uh, Traditional names are being used. So for example, a simple one, uh, one close to Yellowknife is called Deta. And we uh, spelt it wrong for many, many years. So we just made the change just recently actually to change the name to the correct spelling. That's one sample. Um, people that have been in the Northwest Territories for many years, such as myself, um, my partner, um, know the names by old names, uh, for example, Snowdrift, et cetera. So when I'm talking to my partner now and, and using the correct names, um, Lutz OK, uh, Wati, et cetera, we, he doesn't even know what I'm talking about. He's been to all those communities. Actually, he did work for telecoms, communications, um, but he's been to all those communities. So it, it does show that, uh, that the GNWT is open and respectful to Indigenous governments by changing our community names from names that were made from within a colonistic uh, viewpoint. Uh, somebody getting off a plane and saying, thou shalt be snowdrift, because I see a big snowdrift there, to actually the indigenous names that the people have used for centuries. Thank you. A, th a third question is, uh, are you importing LNG by truck now from, uh, from the south uh, to, to replace diesel in some of your communities, or is that uh, still pending? Well, we're um, hopeful to, we're hoping to bring up our own LNG market. As you know, we do have uh, liquid gas in our northern communities. It was thriving at one time. It kind of slowed down because of the, the because of the push against uh, those kind of energy sources. But liquid natural gas is is more uh, climate friendly than what we're using now. Most of our communities are on diesel, so we need to get them off of diesel. So. Uh, it, it, it is a push for us. Um, I'm not keen on bringing up anything from the South in honesty. I'm, I, like I said, uh, it's about Northern people and supporting our Northern people, Northern economy, Northern business. So we are looking at Inuvik and, and how we can open up the liquid gas for at least that region and uh, working with Canada as well and trying to, the federal government, make them understand that liquid gas is cleaner energy in its own, better than diesel. That's great. And then the last question I have for you, and I have to say, I have a, I, 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 I'm not a conflict of interest, but I'm an officer of the uh, Alaska and Alberta Railway. And I know that we passed through the southern part of the NWT on, on our proposed route. You, um, our governor has come out very strong for, for the project and the president allowed the border crossing and we're about to begin the national permitting uh, stage. And, just wondering if there's uh, what the interest is in in the NWT of what that could do to open up uh, transport for mining and, and communities. Well, that's a good question. I know that you're on that. So uh, we've only I've only had my first meeting with the company actually the other day presented to cabinet. I know they've been meeting with some of the indigenous governments in the NWT. So, but the question is um, because I know that it's looking at going across the uh, southern um, part of the Northwest Territories and and perhaps stopping in one small community. But um, in honesty, uh, we're excited about the prospect. We're excited about any economic uh, uh, options coming to the territories. Uh, we need to build our economy, strong advocate of that. However, there's gotta be a benefit for our people as well. Um, 
so it'll be interesting. Um, the presentation was said that, you know, there'll be a huge reliance on Indigenous governments to become partners, but my impression that it meant um, financial partners and our Indigenous governments don't have money. Um, they're reliant on the federal government, they're reliant on the territorial government, and the territorial government doesn't have money either. We're reliant on the federal government. Um, <laughs> so we are interested in still the conversations. It's, it is exciting. However, there has to be a benefit for the Northwest Territories, for the people in the Northwest Territories. Um, and, and of course, to make sure that the environmental assessments, et cetera, are all covered, which I'm sure they will do. Well, thank you very much. Well, with that, I'd like to just again extend our thanks to Juanetta, unless any other questions came in from, from uh, your end. Uh, I, I, I will say, uh, Premier, just uh, uh, you heard a lot of questions about broadband and uh, we have a coastal broadband project uh, in Alaska called Quintillion, which is actually headed in your direction. So uh, it may ultimately uh, kind of wire or bring fiber to the high north in both uh, NWT or Yukon NWT and none of it. And so uh, <clears throat> we're, we're kind of curious, w watching it with uh, bated breath to see if they put the economics together. And uh, so that may have been part of, uh, part of some of the questions you heard today. Uh, the other thing I'll just say is that as we put together our Arctic study, uh, we'll certainly acknowledge uh, your remarks and, and your views today on, on cooperation. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, this dialogue that has been slowed down because of COVID uh, ramps up again. And I really want to thank you for being with us today. And I want to add, I'm going to hand it back to you to close out. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mead. Um, Premier, we do have just two quick questions uh, just to finalize everything. Um, we heard as part of the Arctic uh, Policy Study Group a presentation uh, of some work done by the Inuit Circumpolar Conference on uh, Inuit food sovereignty. And I'm just curious if there are, I mean, obviously the Inuit Circumpolar Conference has uh, uh, an international reach, but uh, I'm just wondering about food sovereignty initiatives within the Northwest Territories and um, what alignment there might be with uh, other global in, uh, indigenous food sovereignty movements? Well, um, I'd have to actually get you more information on that. that. I don't know exactly where we are with that, but I do know that um, food sovereignty is an issue across the North. Um, it's not only the Northwest Territories, it's the Yukon, I'm guessing it's Alaska, and I know it's Nunavut as well. Um, so any work that we can do in partnership to actually address that. Uh, and again, when we talk food security, it's not only it's it's traditional country food, um, but it's also access to mainstream food, bread, milk, eggs, things that we need to survive. So any work that we can do on that, then I'd be more than willing to partner on. But again, I'm, I'm not up to date on that. So I'd have to get more information. Okay, thank you for that. And just one last question. Um, we heard from many um, international uh, finance organizations that they are declaring moratoriums on financing energy projects in uh, the Arctic. And I'm just wondering if uh, there's, if any of those declarations might impact uh, energy development projects in the Northwest and how you might um, be addressing those issues. Absolutely. I haven't heard about a Canadian moratorium on energy. Um, I do know that, like I said, uh, our federal government is really big on green energy. Um, we also have a concern. We want to have green energy too. But um, when you have 33 communities and they're hugely reliant on diesel, it's not as easy as people think. So uh, um, we haven't heard anything about that. In fact, we've been hearing the opposite. Uh, I do believe that we've been working, building up close partnership with our federal government. And we've been really emphasizing, all three territories here in Canada have been emphasizing the need um, for green energy, the high cost of diesel, the impact it's causing. Although recognizing that, um, you know, it's the North is kind of the gathering point for all of the uh, climate change stuff. We are, we're a small population, so our actually emissions are actually low, but we have a part to play in it. So, uh, Getting us off of the diesel is a priority for this government, not only because of the green energy, but by the high cost that it's costing our people as well. So uh, I haven't heard of a moratorium and I certainly would not support one at this point. All right. 
All right, well, thank you so much for that, uh, Premier. We appreciate hearing from you today. Uh, thanks to everybody online for your questions. And uh, we will meet again uh, next week uh, at our usual time at 8 a.m. And we will be hearing from um, Deputy Premier Raj Palila, I believe is his last name, with the Yukon Territory at that time. So uh, look forward to seeing everybody. Uh, we'll have that announcement posted soon. Again, thank you, Premier. Uh, we appreciate your time and uh, appreciate the efforts of your staff to uh, bring you to us today. And uh, with that, we'll sign off and again, wish everyone uh, uh, the best wishes for the new year. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me and hope to see you in person one day. Thank you. So